where you are in the world. Uh, this is our first panel discussion in the web conference that I have the pleasure of introducing features a team of Troika who will discuss primary and secondary education in Brazil. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Guilherme Pacheco, who will be moderating the discussion. He has over 30 years of experience as English teacher and trainer. He has a, um, a BA in English and an MA in education from the University of Chichester and a trainer. He has, as a trainer, sorry, has worked with teachers taking the Cambridge CELTA, ICLT, and Delta work. Guilherme also works as a psychotherapist. And now I would like to introduce the three speakers. First, Renata Borges, who has a degree in languages from uh, Rio de Janeiro State University. Mm -hmm. He has been in ELT for 15 years as a teacher, academic, coordinator, and materials writer and editor. She is currently a consultant in a Troika where she works with materials development and teacher trainer. Second, Tisha Moraes, who has been involved in ELT for over 15 years. She has worked especially with secondary learners, course development and teacher training. She is an experienced um, speaker and article writer. She is a senior consultant at Troika Joint Event Coordinator for IATF uh, YLT SIG and a member of the C group. And the last but not least, uh, Gabriel, um, no, Gabriel uh, Ribeiro, who holds a degree in linguistics from the University of Sao Paulo and a CELTA from Cambridge English. He has been working with secondary learners in Brazil for 10 years, both as a teacher and as a coordinator. He currently works in teacher training and materials design at Troika. Over to you, Troika team. Okay, so good afternoon everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Guilherme and I'm going to be the moderator of this uh, discussion. We'd like to start by saying that when it comes to Brazil, uh, anything we say here today will probably sound rather inaccurate uh, in the sense that you won't necessarily reflect the reality of the, the whole country. So we want to start with a few numbers to give you an idea of the, the size of the country we're talking about. So we have 2.5 million teachers who teach 50 million students in 200,000 schools. So if we take Brazil, obviously, the most populated country uh, in South America, we have roughly 210 million people. If we take the second most populated country, Colombia, uh, has a population of 50 million people. And we have 50 million students. So one of the key issues that we're going to be discussing here is the problem of standardization when you have such a big uh, population. Uh, here's another piece of information from a recent uh, British Council survey. Uh, and the unfortunate number, uh, the idea that only 5% of the population consider themselves fluent uh, in English. Now, of course, the notion of fluency is debatable, but what it means for us today is that we have a number of parents who probably don't feel confident enough to use the language, but would very much like their children to become bilingual uh, in the future. So this is the challenge that English language teachers have uh, ahead of, of them. Uh, in a nutshell, this is the scenario we're in today and around which the panelists will develop their talks. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to turn over the floor to the first speaker, Renata Borges. Renata, over to you. 
Thank you, Guilherme. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Renata Borges. Um, and I, I think that to start, I'd like to talk a little bit about how primary school teachers and uh, teachers from for other grades are seen in Brazil, because I think it explains a little bit of uh, um, what you need to do to become a, a primary school teacher here. So. Uh, for many years, there was a difference in the requirements of what uh, uh, the requirements to do these jobs here in Brazil. And as a consequence, even today, there is a social difference in how these two types of teachers are seen and also in terms of career and salary. Um, and then here, the primary school teachers, they are usually paid less and they are not considered specialists in anything. Uh, so we, I think everybody who is here today probably uh, know everything we need to study and how much we need to prepare to be able to teach young learners because there is a lot more involved than only being proficient uh, in English. Uh, but the general perception I don't know uh, what it's like in other countries, but the general perception here is that it's an easier job to teach children. Um, and I'd like to uh, give a brief explanation on how you can start teaching primary levels here in Brazil. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a new law we had in 1996, but I'm going to start before that. Uh, before this new law was approved in 1996, primary teachers, they were only required to have training at a secondary level. Uh, and what it means is that when you were about to start high school, you could choose to train to be a primary school teacher. And that was it. That was the education, that was the training you had to become um, a primary school teacher here. So. Uh, the big change, the first big change that this law brought, it's a law that uh, was approved in 1996, um, and it was called the New Law of Guidelines uh, and Foundations from Brazilian Education. Uh, so this big change that the, the law brought was a new requirement uh, for teachers of primary level it required teachers to have a university degree. And uh, as you can imagine, at that time, most teachers didn't have university degrees. Most teachers who taught at primary level, they didn't have university degree. So the law defined a 10 year uh, transition period when teachers who didn't have a university degree should get one so they could uh, still have their job, still have their job. Uh, and that transition was very important because it gave time uh, to teachers to prepare and to adapt uh, for uh, this new phase. And then this leads us to um, the training to be an English teacher in Brazil. What does it, what do you have to do to become an English teacher in Brazil? Uh, I would like to say something different, but basically you need to speak English. <laughs> and especially for young learners, because as I said before, te uh, teaching young learners is uh, perceived as an easier uh, job. And then what happens is that most uh, primary school teachers, English teachers here in Brazil, they are not fluent in the language. They can, they, can, they have an intermediate level of English, but they're not, uh, uh, proficient, that's the, the word I'm looking for, they're not proficient uh, in English. And as Guilherme said before, only 5% of the population consider themselves fluent in English. Um, with uh, our, uh, so it's, it's, we have only 5% of the population who consider themselves fluent. And then what happens is when you go to university to study English, most university entries um, they don't, uh, most university entries, they don't uh, measure fluency. 
So most people uh, become, become uh, start university without being fluent in the language. Their expectation is that they're going to learn the language at university. And that doesn't happen usually. Uh, and it doesn't happen, okay, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, it doesn't happen because we don't have um, a standard curriculum for university uh, courses in languages here in Brazil. So universities are more or less free to decide what they're going to teach. And most of them uh, don't focus, focus on making the students fluent uh, in the language. Um, so they, we have a flexible curriculum. It varies a lot. And uh, most people will graduate without being uh, proficient. Uh, and then when you graduate university without being proficient in English and you start looking for a job as an English teacher, what is, uh, what, what's going to happen? They're going to give you children's groups. They're going to give you all the young learners uh, to teach because uh, the perception is that it's easier and you don't need to really be proficient to uh, teach children. Um, and then this has to do uh, with what I said at the beginning about the social perception of primary school teachers here. Uh, but then as uh, parents and schools, they see English as something, English at school as something uh, very desirable and having English classes for children in private schools is very common. Um, but Leticia is going to talk a little bit more, uh, maybe, I, I think, about that, because we have a national common curricular base, and English is not mentioned in primary schools there. Uh, so there is no requirement on what training these teachers should have, as there is no requirement as uh, in what uh, children should learn in primary school regarding English. So. As English uh, for primary schools is not mandatory, uh, English teaching is usually done by language institutes uh, that do not need to obey any regulation on teacher training. And at English institutes, it's also very common to see children groups taught by teachers who are believed to have a lower level of English. And it's not usually required of these teaching, teachers to have a specific training to teach children. Uh, so uh, where does the training come, come from? These teachers training, they usually uh, comes in the form of free service and in service training offered by the same institutions they work for. Uh, so one of the consequences of that is the lack of standardization in teacher training because each institute is going to uh, decide for a method or an approach or a belief uh, that they have concerning um, English teaching and uh, young learners. So another consequence of that is that we have a lot of teachers trained according to what the companies they work for, want them to, to teach, want them to do in the classroom. It doesn't foster plurality as we would like to, to see, it would like to happen. Um, and then I would like to, as I said, all of these, I would like to end on a posit more positive note because uh, most primary teachers that I've had contact with, they did everything they could to feel more prepared to teach English to children. So. Most of them, they, when they start teaching young learners, um, maybe they're not trained to do that, but they read books, they take courses. And something that I've seen happening uh, that is very interesting, they uh, usually form this informal special interest group inside the, the schools that they work because uh, with all the teachers of, uh, for young learners, because it's a place where they can share uh, their practice, ideas for activities, insights that they have. So um, I've seen a lot of very good uh, young learners, teachers, because they they study by themselves. Because uh, they, they when they start, the, they get in the classroom, into the classroom, they see that it's not only English you need to to learn to know to teach children. 
And I think that... Okay. All right. So I guess what we're hearing from Renata at this point, when it comes to lower primary years, uh, remember I started talking about challenges, and I, I suspect that you're able to see the challenge we have when, as Renata mentioned quite uh, well, uh, the task of teaching young learners is usually given to the novice teacher, to the less experienced teacher, to the teacher whose uh, level of English is probably not C1 or C2. So these are some of the uh, issues at stake when it comes to lower primary years. By the way, before I hand over to Leticia Moraes, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, remember to write them in the chat box so that uh, uh, we'll be able to pick them up towards the end of this uh, forum. So over to Leticia Moraes now. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Leticia Moraes, as I have already been introduced, and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, lower secondary education in Brazil. And as Renata mentioned, uh, we do have this uh, government determination for uh, a university degree uh, for teachers here. Um, However, uh, when they are at university to get the, the, the teaching license, they don't have to actually teach. They can uh, simply, well, they are required to observe some lessons to sometimes act upon as uh, class assistants. But what happens in real life is that um, they are not very well seen in the schools. Schools don't like this. Uh, students going there, they, and teachers particular, they feel that they are going to be judged. So many times the teachers, the novice teachers, the, the, the students from university, they are not welcomed at schools. And the regular teachers from the groups that should be observed usually would sign the paper and say, I'd rather you didn't observe my lesson. And this, uh, with this situation, what happens is that teachers uh, would graduate but have no basis whatsoever in order to teach. So they would be, as Renata said, they would be thrown to uh, young learners groups. And when it comes to um, mainstream, uh, mainstream education, many times a teacher who is uh, specialized in Portuguese ends up getting some lessons in English as well. So um, we, we feel that we, we have a long way to, to, to go in order to actually develop teachers, especially when you talk about mainstream education. Um, uh, Renata mentioned briefly uh, about our uh, national common curricular base, we call BUMCC, and this is something that has been, that is under implementation now currently, and it has some impact on the teaching, or it's supposed to have. Uh, when we look at the text from BMCC, uh, we see that uh, it's really beautiful in terms of what it should be covered and what, how language should be seen. So it talks about the four skills, talking, it focuses more on lexis and grammar, it doesn't talk too much about uh, discourse and pronunciation. But uh, it's not only grammar focused. Uh, it talks a lot about multiliteracy, so it's not concerned only about the written text. It also works with different kinds of uh, uh, different ways of getting new information. It's really concerned about this intercultural awareness that students could develop via language, and it's. Overall, it sees language as it sees English as a lingua franca. So it would um, the, the idea is that it wouldn't focus so much on 
slight uh, details about uh, pronunciation in a country or in another one, it would be it would be develop English as a means for learners to talk to the world. However, uh, this has some implications, right? So it's very beautiful in theory, but when we look at that and we look at the kind of qualification that teachers get or what they learn at universities and how much teaching practice they actually don't have while they are uh, getting ready to become teachers, uh, it poses lots of questions. So first of all is uh, that many teachers actually don't know what lingua franca is and how it is um, supposed to be dealt with in the classroom. And many teachers, especially uh, teachers who have been in the market for a while, tend to have a more old-fashioned way of looking at language, more form-based. And then for this teacher to fit uh, the beneficiary, or beneficiary is usually really hard. And what have, has been happening is that teachers don't get a special uh, training for that. They got in contact with uh, the NPC. Uh, but depending on where you are, uh, you just have that and then you have to start adapting and using that as possible and adopting the curriculum that was developed for that school. And um, when you look at the the process of multiliteracy, teachers do need some, would need some help there. What we see is that uh, we have some examples of uh, courses that have been started to be offered focusing on the NPC, especially uh, in specific cities. I wouldn't say that uh, spread all over the country. As Guilherme mentioned in the beginning, we are a fairly large country. So there are lots of differences from one region to, to the other. And the places where this knowledge of teaching and uh, learning are concentrated is significant. So it's usually concentrated in a few states, uh, sometimes even in a few cities. and people have to travel to those places in order to get there. Now we can start to feel some schools uh, who, uh, that started to try to bring people to their uh, schools in order to help teachers and train teachers uh, to become, to improve their, uh, in terms of career and to be able to actually implement what our curricular base states. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is a consolidated process yet, but we can see that this started happening, especially in the private sector. Uh, we have been living a boom of bilingual education uh, in Brazil. So we have lots of bilingual systems uh, that sell the, their courses and to the whole country. And they also offer uh, their own training. So, uh, as Renata mentioned, in the case of the primary learners, it ends up happening the same as uh, the same for the lower secondary. When you're talking about the systems going to school and say, okay, that's the material, that's how we teach this material, instead of actually developing critical thinking uh, in the teachers, critical thinking, and uh, working on more soft skills related to teaching, which are not actually looking at the material provided and applying the way they want. So um, we have a long way to go in terms of empowering teachers to become uh, more aware of what they are actually doing in the classroom in order to make more better informed decisions. So. We, um, we have to work a lot on that, besides working with, uh, working on language proficiency, as Renata already mentioned. But in order to be able to use that language 
and teach the way our national curriculum states, we have to work with different uh, um, uh, skills and in, with actually teaching. And we do need to work a lot on that. And it's something that we feel the need nowadays. Um, and it's basically that, right? And I guess my time is up already. Is it, Chris? Do I have more time? I don't know. I'm not actually checking the time, but. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So do you want to say something else? Or? No, no, it's fine. Okay. So I guess what we hear very clearly from Leticia is the fact that we are at the moment going through this curriculum framework that has become a buzzword in education in Brazil. Uh, and it is an attempt at standardization. So what we need to remember is that the standards are, are a sort of a lever for change. But implementing these changes is, is a huge challenge. And I think that this is the moment. Uh, at, at, this is where we're in uh, at the moment. There's also the issue, which is very clearly uh, uh, about the differences in terms of methodological approaches. So we have the communicative approach. We have ELF or English as a lingua franca, and the more traditional uh, uh, schools. To, on top of that, the bilingual system, and this means that people are not, or teachers sometimes, are not exactly sure of what they should be doing. So we're going to hand it over to Gabriel Ribeiro now, uh, who will talk for a little longer. And reminder, once again, if you have any questions, please type them up so that we can pick them uh, up later at the end. Gabriel? Hello. Gabriel? Hi. Um, I would like to okay, start by, uh, we've been talking about upper secondary teacher education in Brazil. And I think that the first thing that we need to have in mind uh, compared to lower secondary education, which Leticia was telling you about, hi. Uh, compared to what she was saying, uh, in terms of uh, the curriculum and everything. Uh, upper secondary education is very much informed by the the test that, uh, that students have to take after uh, when they want to enter university, which is called vestibular in Brazil. Those admission tests, they tend to, to evaluate the student's ability in terms of reading. So it's a very functional test uh, rather than uh, any oral production or anything like that. Because of that, uh, even more so than in uh, elementary school and everything, uh, in high school, in upper secondary, uh, students are expected to develop those reading skills and classes are informed by that. Even in upper class schools. And um, I think this differentiation is important in Brazil because uh, in, in the private sector, compared to the public one. Uh, because of the, the resources, students have sometimes, they are divided by their levels. Uh, instead of being you know, 30 students in one room uh, with varying levels of uh, proficiency there. In public schools, this is extremely common. Uh, I would risk and say that it's uh, almost 100% of schools which have this sort of uh, mixed environment in and there's a, a very uh oh sorry you can't hear me okay uh sorry 
and because of that, uh, in those schools, uh, in, in the public sector, uh, every year you see pretty much the same things. Students who have some knowledge of, uh, of the language, students who have no knowledge of the language, they are, uh, they are all, oh, sorry, I can't see me here. Hi. Sorry about that. I'll go on. Uh, and as Hanata said before, and that she says well, uh, student uh, teachers are required to to have a degree, a university level degree. In the case of Twitter, basically they are licensed to be teachers, uh, but most of them. Uh, in studies show that this can be as high as 60% of them. They are not actually proficient and they do not have any knowledge of the language before they enter university. Uh, so Renata said that uh, student uh, teachers are expected to basically speak English. Uh, that might be a little optimistic. Some teachers are not even expected to speak the language. And, and we have basically three different uh, areas in which uh, teachers act. The regular schools, the prep courses, they are specific to prepare for university exams, and the language schools as well. In those prep courses, teachers have, uh, they have pretty much the same, uh, the same education than teachers who teach in regular schools. Uh, but in language schools, most teachers do not have a university degree in languages, let alone in English. Uh, and those language schools are actually where most of the acquisition of the language takes place. So what has been increasingly happening, especially for upper secondary education, is that those language schools are teaching inside regular schools. Uh, they have uh, some partnerships with uh, upper class schools in which they have uh, kind of like extra classes. So usually in the afternoon uh, where students can actually learn the language, they are divided by the level. Uh, but in regular schools, this doesn't usually happen. Uh, and for upper secondary students who do not usually have much time because they are preparing for university. Uh, when they go to language schools, they usually go to language schools outside of their regular schools. Uh, and they are usually pair, they are usually in groups of adults. They, they do not have specific uh, groups for them. Uh, so with that, uh, and the, the rise of these partnerships with language schools, uh, there has been, an increasingly uh, an increasing number of students who have uh, a better knowledge of the language because of these extra classes that take place in their schools and students who still see English as sort of a, a useless class, something that they usually skip. Uh, in those prep courses where students have English classes, for example, uh, by the end of the year when tests are closer, even students who have a lot of trouble with English, they are usually giving up attending those classes. They 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 seem to think that uh, they are not if they haven't learned by then, they won't learn anything, and that the other subjects are usually more important to them. Because of that, the teachers who are uh, who teach English, uh, as Leticia said, most of them do not even have a degree in English specifically. They specialize in Portuguese and they tend, half of them or more, do not actually take any extra courses once they are in the career, especially in the public sector. Some universities, some public universities have been trying to, to amend the, this gap in their knowledge by providing uh, special courses for teachers who teach in the public sector, but those initiatives are still uh, incipient. And uh, we still need to see the, the effect that this is going to have in teacher education in general. Uh, there have been some other initiatives, uh, especially with uh, the increase of online courses and uh, distance courses to, um, 
For example, in the state of Sao Paulo, which is the, the largest in Brazil, the government has been uh, providing those teachers with, uh, with incentives uh, in terms of career development and career growth. And also with those courses that they can take online, they can do this uh, in person. So uh, the problem is in general being recognized, but uh, as a rule, it's not really being uh, addressed properly. Uh, so to wrap this up, uh, I think that the, the main takeaway for upper secondary is uh, that it's very similar in a lot of aspects with uh, younger students, but uh, a little bit in, in tune with what uh, Hinata and Lichis were saying about uh, the less experienced teachers being assigned to those uh, younger levels, because they're usually more they, they usually are uh, more troublesome. They usually are harder work. Uh, you would expect the, the the teachers who teach upper secondary to be a little bit more uh, knowledgeable and have uh, studied a little bit more, which is sometimes true. But uh, again, compared to what we have, is not um, we cannot really say that we have uh, prepared students as, uh, okay. teachers as a rule. So I hope I try to adjust well. the, the microphone. I hope you can hear me better now. Uh, I think basically what I hear from Gabriel is a sort of a mismatch between. What is the needs for the entrance exam? for university and obviously the huge washback effect that this has in the way that the teachers teach in the classroom. And uh, earlier what Leticia mentioned, the, 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 the curriculum framework which talks about English as a lingua franca, English for international communication. So these are some of the issues that we still need to adjust. We have an interesting question coming from Maria Irene Delgado Pinheiro, who is a teacher in uh, Portugal, and she says that she gets lots of Brazilians uh, who transfer to schools in Portugal, and that level of English compared to the level of the same-aged Portuguese students is not the same, and she's wondering whether any of the panelists would like to comment <laughs> on why? Um, actually, English learning in Brazil is very inconsistent. So there is usually what we call school English. And when we, when we ask someone if they have studied English or learned English and they answer with that, with that, I have only school English, it means that they don't speak English. <laughs> yes. uh, because the, because of the lack of uh, training that teachers have to actually teach and their lack of proficiency in the language, it's very common for the students to learn verb to be over and over again. So they start in primary school, they start with verb to be in a more playful way. They go to lower secondary, they start from verb to be again. They go to upper secondary and it goes all over again. Uh, it, it, it even becomes a joke. But there are some other schools where uh, English teaching and learning is very consistent. So, uh, and well done and uh, working on the continuity of the process and so on. So it depends a lot on where these students uh, study, mostly. I don't know. No, if you, anyone wants okay, to thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just wondering how old these students okay. are. I don't know if Marie Irene could uh, help us because I think the, if they are very young, uh, um, they usually they, they probably uh, they were probably studying at a uh, language institute, um, and uh, I don't know if they were. Uh, younger than seven years old, uh, they wouldn't be alphabetized yet. So, really, there's uh, it, it might um, 
it might feel slower for them, uh, the learning of English. So I don't know if they are very young or if they were teenagers, then uh, it would be different. But if it, they were very young, because they would, if they studied, unless they were in a bilingual school, um, I, I think they wouldn't be fluent in English at this age. Okay, we have another question uh, in relation to international certificates and the question is, are we allowed to teach if you don't have any special education but have certificates such as TKT, CELTA, DELTA, uh, etc.? Yes, in, in, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. No, I think what Leticia is going to say, yeah, it depends on what, where you, were, you want to teach because uh, language institutes here, they don't need to follow any uh, regulations on what training teachers uh, should have. So at a language institute, most of them probably you would be allowed to teach. I think Leticia wants to say no. Yeah, and lots of the language institutes don't even require university degree. Mm -hmm. uh, they want the, they are more interested in CELTAs and mostly CELTA, uh, than uh, university degrees. But when you go to mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, schools, then it's the other way around. Then CELTA means nothing for them, and they need university degrees because it fulfills the requirements uh, set by the, the government. Okay, I think in terms of questions from the chat box, uh, I don't see any others. So, before I guess I, I while I was speaking about uh, teachers being motivated somehow to develop, and this is a, a bit of an issue because sometimes. Uh, I will give you a very concrete example that happens here in the state of Sao Paulo. The state encourages the, this professional development and they provide courses. But the, not all the teachers, but many teachers, they are more interested in the points that they get for taking these courses than actually learning and applying what they learn. They do that because they would get points that would give them something uh, later on, like uh, they could get uh, some kind of benefit or it has to do with their progression of career, but not necessarily uh, learning. And when teachers uh, want to develop, many times they have to go for that, they have to, to pursue that. Uh, and it's not always easy for them to find the means to, to doing that, depending on the situation where they are. Uh, because uh, as Renata mentioned, that they have their own training. Sometimes they don't want uh, people to get any kind of training outside their own institution, not to deviate from their standards. And does anyone? Uh, uh, I. Go ahead. I guess one of the other issues which I think I think one of the other issues which is I think probably clear to everyone is the issue of the oral skills because we have to remember that up until very recently oral skills were not meant to be developed in lower primary schools uh, and secondary schools as well and so this is all very new uh, for the teacher who because he didn't have the oral skills, he was more comfortable teaching the grammar and reading skills or listening skills. And all of a sudden, this teacher is required to teach English for international communicative purposes. So this has become a challenge for the teacher as well as for the student who was used to, as I think Leticia mentioned, a more traditional uh, teaching environment. and 
all of a sudden was required a lot more effort and a lot more from from them. So I suspect we'll need a, uh, some time, a few years, to adjust this. I just want situation. to add something to what Guilherme just said. Uh, a British Council uh, survey found that uh, over half of teachers were four years and older. So uh, teaching English in public schools. So uh, obviously in Brazil we've had developments in terms of English English teaching in the past 20, 30 years. So it's relevant that a lot of teachers who are still teaching, they learn English in a way that we do not really use nowadays as much as we did. And uh, we've had zero people who actually had contact with the, the NCC in schools, right? So we haven't really learned using those kind of uh, methods and these kinds of approaches. So uh, it will take some time for us to, to adapt to that as well, right? There is one more question. Uh, we understand from what you said that there is no fixed curriculum to be followed by teachers in schools from the primary to the upper secondary stages. I think I'm, I'm going to start by just saying one thing, and perhaps people can complement. Uh, from what I understand, the, the, the curriculum framework is, is competence-based. So it will give suggestions to teachers, but it will not, and because it is not grammar-oriented, it, it makes it more difficult for uh, the uh, teachers to follow a standard, okay? So from what I suspect, I'm not a specialist, but maybe somebody can say a bit more about this. There are suggestions as to ways to go, and certainly the competences that are required, but not necessarily a language curriculum. Can I say something here? Uh... Yes. Please, please what do. Is, um, according to our law, uh, learning English is not a requirement for primary school. So we can have schools without English whatsoever because it's not required and it's not in our uh, national curriculum. We do have this fixed, it's fixed, but okay, we do have a curriculum, a basis, uh, some kind of basis for, for the uh, the development of the curriculum, but there is a lot of room for regional uh, adaptation because we have very different contexts all over the country because of our size. And then uh, you, when it comes to lower secondary, then it, it's, in terms of English, it's very specific. You have the specific abilities to be developed. Then they mention, uh, for example, use of can to talk about abilities. It's there stated, but there's nothing for the primary. And when it goes to the upper secondary, it's also uh, more general again. So it has more general competences to be covered, but you don't have exactly the points, the abilities, and the skills to be developed. Because it's from now, because the upper secondary uh, national curriculum is very new. It hasn't been, it has been uh, approved this year, last year, maybe the, the, the end of last year, but it hasn't been implemented yet. It's under implementation. Uh, it will start to become compulsory soon, but not yet. And then it's, it's based on the, the, the assumption that these uh, skills and abilities will have been developed in lower secondary, and nothing will have, will have happened in the primary. So. We do, but don't. It depends on where you're talking about. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we've covered all all the uh, the questions. I don't know if anybody wants to. Time is up. Yes. We, I guess we have a, a please, bit more. I just ahead. want to say something. Um, okay, can I? go ahead. 
because I feel that we can sound very negative. Uh, <laughs> because we, we tend to be very critical about what's going on because we, we want uh, our situation to, to actually improve. Uh, teacher training in Brazil is very inconsistent when it comes to, to English. So it doesn't mean that it's always uh, a difficult situation. You do have institutions that uh, encourage their teachers to pursue their own development within their own institution and outside. We do have very uh, solid curriculums developed. It depends, but it will always depend on which uh, state you're talking about, which city you're talk talking about, which school, spe specific school you're talking about. So it's very inconsistent. We have lots and lots of differences. But although our national curriculum may have some flaws, I'd say that uh, we are in the we're moving towards something better than it used to be because we're moving to seeing English as a lingua franca as opposed to seeing English as grammar, 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 and uh, focus on uh, a specific country, the language from a specific country to English as a lingua franca, focus on communication, thinking about intercultural competences and awareness as well. So I'd say we, we started a new journey there, but that's only the beginning. So that's why it may look a little bit gloomy at times. Okay, thank you very much um, to the Troika team. Um, all the elements that you have mentioned today are related to language policy and how they start from the policy and they just start thinking about how we carry this on with teachers and teacher education and educational system. Um, it, I think it's very interesting to see in the discussion how there are great ideas um, from the local area, from Brazil, to analyze the reality and how similar uh, we have realities of multicultural elements in Latin America. Um, so thank you very much for this great way to kind of um, summarize um, the educational system and in ELT um, in, in Brazilian um, education, primary and secondary, and um, uh, we are very proud to have you here as a panel. Um, it's our first panel. So. Thank you. It was a great experience for, um, for all of us. Thank you. So we're going to take a break now. Thank you very much again to Troika Pano in Brazil, and we will be back in 1945 GMT for our next talk. Thanks again. Bye.